All right, you beautiful humans. I still get questions on this one quite often, actually. So you have got two scenarios in front of you. Those two scenarios are, of course, packed with some subcategories depending on the use case, but we're gonna try to keep it lean on this one because I've done several videos on this particular subject. And if you've decided to invest in the latest M2 MacBook Air, or really just one of the recent pieces of hardware from Apple that doesn't have user upgradable storage, and you're holding tight onto that $200, 200 US or more, depending on your situation when it comes to upgrading the storage, and doesn't make financial sense to just go for the base model and then use an external SSD down the road when you have the means or really the need. And of course, speed is everything when it comes to comparing ourselves to others, but how does it really compare to your particular workflow? And at a higher cost of more, does it really make good business sense? And so the first option here is that let's say that you've got a little extra in your budget and after you've considered whether the extra unified memory would be beneficial or not, but I think in many cases it can be, but what's up for grabs is the investment in more storage space. All of these machines are going to have added costs, whether immediately or throughout their use. But when it comes to the ultra portable nature of the M2 MacBook Air, I do think that being as untethered as possible is a very freeing feeling. Say freeing feeling 10 times in a row, but is that feeling enough to part with an extra 200 US dollars to double the storage or yet another 200 on top of that to double it again? I mean, honestly, the read and write speeds, even on the crippled base model, and I do kid, but it's still very fast when compared to many other offerings on the market. But the questions to ask are, and these are gonna be, there's gonna be some overlap here, but what does your current workflow and demand look like? And what's the available space on your current machine that you're upgrading and are the files and folders that have lingered there, like could they have been easily cleaned up in, in sort of over the months or years? Or have you needed to move larger projects on the internal drive, even temporarily, until you complete that project and then archive it later? Or do you use any form of cloud storage, whether for photos, videos, or something like OneDrive or Google Docs to keep most of the things that you're working on for the most part off of that machine? Or do you think that you'll ever need or run a virtual machine on this device? Although you can do this with an external SSD, and of course I will discuss this briefly. Now, if you've managed with say like 256 gigabytes of advertised storage for a while, and this hasn't impact your workflow, then what would change in the coming months or year to question whether this is enough moving forward? And of course, there is often this feeling that if you're upgrading your machine, that you might as well upgrade your machine. And I'll share that I don't believe I've ever met or spoke to anyone that has said that they've regretted getting more internal storage. And again, when the budget allows, that extra 200 US could save you way more in depreciation costs because then you end up trading in a newly purchased, recently purchased machine because you need that storage or whatever upgrade, you've got the time lost, and that's a big one for me, and of course the frustration. But if you're an external kind of storage, dongle life loving human on the move, of course be careful of the cords, then this would be my list in order of preference and we'll work our way down from price, the advertised performance, and of course the upgradability. And two of my trusty enclosures that keep coming back are the Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4.0 enclosures from Fledging and Acasis respectively. But let me also say that there are similar offerings in this category. And one of the things that you'll wanna look for in the specs that aren't always listed, we're gonna geek out here just briefly, and then I'll bring you back. But that is the Thunderbolt controller and that you might see the name Alpine Ridge for that controller for Thunderbolt 3 exclusively, or Titan Ridge, which is paired with a J Micron bridge chip that then makes this compatible with Thunderbolt 3 or able to be used as a USB-C device that would fall back to that particular protocol. And before someone throws their keyboard at me in the comments, let me clarify that the whole USB 4 versus the USB 4.0 is a bit of a marketing speak uh, when it comes to the certification that occurs with Thunderbolt, which it should occur and it does occur, and should also happen for USB 4. However, many manufacturers have skirted around this. And so as the consumer, you rely on those of us that test these devices and without getting in the weeds here, because this is a separate thread altogether, I have run more tests than I can count, including daily workflows and the fledging has been exceptional for Thunderbolt 3 and the Acasis with both Thunderbolt and USB protocol. Now, as far as the SSD, we're actually talking about NVMe as the fastest when it comes to advertised speeds. And NVMe is also a communication protocol. However, I will reiterate that you will see SSDs that advertise speeds anywhere from 3,500 megabytes per second read and write 
to anywhere from 5,000 or even 7,000 megabytes per second, depending on whether it's a Gen 3 or Gen 4, with Gen 4 typically being more expensive, although that gap is continuing to close depending on which one you decide to purchase or where you're from purchasing from. But those speeds are based on the SSD being installed on the board, on the motherboard, when you have a PC, and I've built several of them, and you can get those speeds. So when installed in these external enclosures, you will lose some of that theoretical speed because when you plug these into a Thunderbolt port that's rated at 40 gigabits per second, you would expect, like if you do the math, that you would have, that, that would translate to 5,000 megabytes per second. However, we have to consider that there is an allocation of bandwidth in these ports that occurs here because of peripherals and external displays, especially in that what you're likely gonna be seeing is 26 gigabits per second, which translates to, it, it's roughly 3,200, 3,250 megabytes per second on read and write. Just depends, give or take. And I know we're throwing out lots of numbers, but before I lose you here, because you just wanna to get to the goods, I have found either of these enclosures paired with a Samsung 980 Pro to still, I just recently bought another one as my top go-to for my workflow. There are other options and I have tested some that are not recommended by the manufacturer of these enclosures, but the Samsung 970 Evo Plus, the Western Digital SN750 and the SN850, they have all worked on these Apple Silicon devices. And initially the pricing on these setups are going to be higher, but with some discounts that this, like a particular combo could be one, a one terabyte setup that can land around 250-ish US dollars. That's with the enclosure and of course the SSD. Now, when you compare that to upgrading internally, that would be $400. And the nice thing about the enclosure is that if you wanna swap out SSDs, upgrade the storage, you're definitely good to go. And as far as the speeds are concerned, depending on the value that you're looking for and considering the synthetic bench, the speeds are very close to the internal on the M2. And I mean, at least the upgraded one. But as I've said before, that these speeds do help with large file transfers. The day-to-day, -day, like you really wouldn't take full advantage of these speeds because even with video editing, I have shared that the program itself, the editor can only read and write so fast. And so your CPU and your GPU are really your bottleneck and especially on the M2. And even if you have gigabit ethernet and you're moving large amounts of data back and forth, you still have the threshold of the integrity of that connection and the servers in which you're transferring to and from. So if this seems to be more than what you want to spend and the synthetic speeds aren't really what you're interested in, then a USB-C enclosure would be a good next option if you want to stay with that DIY scenario, such as this one from, yeah, from Sabrent. And I, I still use it. And of course the slower theoretical speeds, but the performance day to day, it, it shouldn't suffer, but these would be rated at around a thousand megabytes per second, which seems like a massive hit for that 980 Pro for what it's rated at. So of course you could again, save a little coin and go with something that is less expensive for the SSD. But let me just reiterate that this is your data. These are your projects, items that I would assume that are extremely important to you. So I would just consider that when you were making that investment. But for the one and done, I am going to mention the SanDisk Extreme. I've had this for years and at around 1000 megabytes per second, it is fantastic. But do be careful because on a Mac, there are versions of this SSD. And so there is a USB-C 3.2 that have advertised speeds of up to 2000 megabytes per second, but it will, based on the protocol in that Thunderbolt port, it will fall back to 1000 megabytes per second. So really just save some money and skip those unless you're really getting a good deal on them. Now, the Samsung T7 is also a popular all around at 1000 megabytes per second. Again, I think a counterpart to the SanDisk read and write, but if by chance you happen to be doing some video editing, there is a chance that the T5 at around 550 megabytes per second could bottleneck on certain video codecs when you're playing it back in the timeline, not the export. I have tested this and with some heavy codecs that have been converted to ProRes, the timeline has been reading at over 400 megabytes per second. And as we know with these Apple Silicon machines, we're getting lower read and write speeds anyway, sometimes as low as 350 megabytes per second. So do keep that in mind, but general day to day, it's still gonna be fantastic and probably save you quite a bit of money. So when you're considering your buying decision, if you've already invested in a base model device and you need more storage, then these are a few options for those files that you're accessing more frequently. But I would also recommend that if you're just looking for archiving and storage of files, things that you're just not really accessing very frequently at all, then there are some more affordable and practical options out there, which 
I did do a video on that and we'll link that up. But as I've mentioned earlier, I personally run a virtual machine with Windows on the M2 and I keep it on the internal. However, I also did a video on running this virtual machine on the external. You can run an, a, a whole operating system on an external SSD if you choose to do so, but of course that will add to your requirement of being tethered. I just wanted to share my experience that even though a two terabyte external solution is still less expensive than upgrading the internal, for my particular use case, I need to be portable. That is why I purchased this machine. That is my primary use case. And the less that I have to be tethered, the better. So the investment does make financial sense for me when looking at the longer return of my time and of course, less hassle. But do look at the manufacturer's recommendations on those DIY solutions. And of course, those of us testing these SSDs in these enclosures to make sure that you're getting the best experience. I will see you in the comments section. That was a lot. You go rock those faces and I will catch you right back here on the next one. I've already eaten. <laughs>